This evening we're here with Patrick McWilliams and he and I'll be doing the discussion from this morning's sermon from Ezekiel chapters 8 and 9 and then Acts kind of with a new covenant point of view at Acts chapter 17 with Paul's sermon to the uh, Areopagus. So Patrick, uh, you said you had a few comments or a few questions. I'll let you begin and then we'll we'll kick it back and forth, man. Okay, cool. So uh <clears throat> so I kind of dove in and looked at some of the verses within these two chapters uh, a little bit more closely and, and noticed some interesting things. So um, the description in chapter 8, verse 2, was, Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward fire, mm -hmm. and from his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. And there's a similar description of somebody that is given earlier in... Um, chapter 1 uh, in verses 4 and 27 and in there in those passages Ezekiel falls down as if to worship and he's not condemned or anything like that so right. I think that this would be um, representative of it's a manifestation of God's glory right, as opposed to like a uh, just a, a vision person <laughs> yeah I, I certainly agree um, I don't know that it's Yahweh himself uh, I don't know that it's not, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, somehow or another on, on, the, on the tour, so to speak, and even into chapter um, 9, I notice that when he is used, he has a capital H on the pronoun in the NASB. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So I think... Interesting. Yeah, I think that is interesting. Um, but I, I, I think that it's just a really good point in this entire section and in the entire narrative of Ezekiel is we, we know this is God speaking to him. And does he speak through this messenger or is, he, is it somewhat, maybe some kind of pre-incarnate appearance? I, I mean, mm -hmm. what, what do you, what is you, what's your conclusion? I mean, you've thought so, about it. Yeah, so if I'm going to go back to, to chapter 1 real quick and yeah. read those verses. You said 4 and 27. Yeah, so, so verse 4, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber, mm -hmm. out of the midst of the fire. And then in 27, um, And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about. So the description is the same. And then following in verse 28, um, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. And then goes into chapter 2, Son of man, stand upon thy feet and I will speak unto thee. Mm -hmm. So I think it is, I think it's supposed to be a... a at least a representation of the glory of of the Lord, the Lord being in all caps, so it's Yahweh. Yeah. I, I think that's true, and I think when you look at other passages in the Old Testament, uh, Moses says that he wants to see God's glory. Mm -hmm. and, and even in that, God says, you can't see me and live, but he's, he makes his glory, in a sense, pass before him. Isaiah certainly sees the, the, the Lord high and lifted up and a glorious vision uh, and I don't I don't get the sense you know when you see the 70 elders in chapter 8 who are worshiping the animals uh, the, the depictions of the animals on the walls the thing that, y that you think about and even some of the commentators talk about is okay this is certainly different from the 70 elders who went up on the mountain with Moses and had the banquet before the presence of God um, th these men you just see how far the fall of Israel has gone in that these men think that God doesn't see them, whereas the other 70 are sitting there in the very, you know, as, as I guess as close to the presence of God as a human being could get without dying. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, I, th I think, and I think, too, what you, something that maybe you're getting at, but the whole idea, and you see this in chapter 9, too, is the glory of the Lord 
in, in, in some sense, dwelling in the temple in a special manifestation of his glory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So something else, um, since you mentioned about how they, <clears throat> they're acting like the Lord doesn't see them. Right. So I'm um, looking at chapter 8, verse 12. Whoops. Uh, yeah, I see it. Um, then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, for the Lord has forsaken the earth. So a couple of observations that I had from, the, from that verse. Um, you know, you get this image, uh, you know, this is a vision, right? A, a yep. Dark chambers of, of imagery. And, you know, the Lord seeth us not, right, in the King James English. Mm -hmm. You know, but what it brought to mind for me is like our own our own imaginations and thoughts. You know, that's like the only part of us that that's truly secret from from any other person. Right. Um, No one can see inside our heads. Right. And we think, oh, well, if we keep this thought inside of our head, if I hate this person or if I um, am consumed with lust for this person or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's okay because it's, it's in my head, right? right? The Lord doesn't see it and people don't see it. Um, but clearly, like the implication here, and, and because it's being shown to Ezekiel, the Lord does indeed see that. Um, and <clears throat> and there, there is, there's no place that can be hidden from, no. from his sight. Um, so there, there was that, but then it also jumped out at me that they're saying the Lord doesn't see us, mm-hmm. but they're saying his covenant name when they're saying that. They're not saying a generic word for God. They're saying no. our covenant God, Yahweh, does not see us. So they, are, they are consciously... And has forsaken us. Right, yeah. and they, they are consciously breaking covenant. Yeah. So if we're at all tempted, not... Not that we are, but if anyone would be tempted at all to sympathize with the people in this in these passages that are about to have judgment rain down upon them, like they they are fully aware of what they're doing. They even refer to him by his covenant name. Um, that that was something that that really jumped out at me this morning. I, I think too, it's kind of quid pro quo in the sense that. They, they still hold on to the temple in one sense as kind of a good luck charm, mm-hmm. you know, but they're, 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 they're trying to cover all their bases with all these religions, and yet you can see in this verse a cynicism. He does not see us. He has forsaken the land. And because they feel this way and they think this way, they themselves, whether, whether deliberately or, or maybe subconsciously, they are forsaking the Lord. Why would they feel like he, would, he had forsaken the land? Well, I think they believe he's forsaken the land because the Babylonians have had their, had their way. And to this point, the best and brightest of the people who, who live there, including many of the priests, have have been deported. Mm-hmm. I thought about Ezekiel in this, and he, I, I sometimes think, and maybe I should take more time to develop this in sermons. But you know, it's hard, Patrick, when you're when you're trying to go thirty to forty minutes <laughs> to cover. I mean, you're teaching Sunday school right now. You know what a cruel taskmaster time can be. Oh, I've already told them I've extended it by a couple of weeks. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so it's a, it, it, it can be a cruel taskmaster. Um, I, I think about Ezekiel, and as he goes there, Ezekiel the man is seeing this, and he's trained all his life to be a priest. Mm. So not only is there the fact that he's been deported and he's in Babylon, but his, his thoughts of ever getting back, if he ever had any thoughts of getting back and, 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 and being a priest in the temple again, these thoughts are being dashed. He's, he is getting hit. The prophet is being hit from every side. Because God is showing him. I, I, love, I love this point you brought up. They think God doesn't see. And God is saying to, to Ezekiel, come see. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, come, come see. Behold. Yeah. Look at this. I mean, God, in fact, does see. But in the sense of his response, 
he says, I essentially don't see because I'm not going to do anything. And uh, the, the saying that I used this morning I think is very appropriate, and that is the best thing that a person can say to and, and mean it to the Lord is not my will but thy will be done. And the worst thing that God can say to us as human beings, okay, go ahead and have your way. Mm-hmm. You know, your will be done. Because our will, there's a way that seems right to man, but it, in the end thereof is death and destruction. And that's at the end of verse no, uh, or chapter 9 in verse 10 when he says, As for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, yeah. but I will recompense their way upon their head, and they will get what they deserve, basically. Exactly. Yeah, verse, exactly. Yep. So I had a couple. I, I had a bunch of like little small observations and stuff like that. There were little cool details, sure. like how in verse sixteen they're facing away from the altar mm-hmm. to worship their own stuff, and it's directly opposed. So, you know, the implications of that for some kind of syncretism, some blending of of Christian worship with with pagan traditions and stuff like that. But uh, I, I, and I, I think that has happened. And, yeah. And I think there's a difference. Yeah. I I think, and, and maybe this goes to. I started to listen to a D.A. Carson sermon on this passage, mm-hmm. and it played his reading of it. It was, stream, it was a streaming thing from a gospel coalition. And once he read it, he made a few comments. It was an hour long, which is what a sermon really should be. <laughs> it was an hour long, but it cut off at about, I was into it about nine minutes. Uh. And I don't know why he mentioned this, but he, he mentioned about worship, and he said, you know, uh, a long time ago when in, in churches the worst place in the church was in the choir because there was so much so many egos in the choir and there'd be wars in the choir and he said but it spread into the church where now we have you know battles over how we're going to worship uh-huh. and certainly I think there can be there can be some flexibility in how we worship but there can be no flexibility in who we worship yeah which I think if we worship God, he has the ultimate say in how he's worshiped. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, so, so for context, the verse, um, the second part of it says, you know, at the, at the door of the temple of the Lord, we're about um, between the porch and the altar, we're about five and 20 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord yeah. and their faces toward the east. Mm-hmm. And they worship the sun toward the east. So they're at the right, right place doing the wrong thing <laughs> yes that as well as it's so there's these subtle details that the more familiar you are with the layout of the tabernacle and the temple and right. some of the earlier passages and earlier books of the bible mm-hmm. the more significance you'll draw out of this so in verse three um it says that it's at the and he put forth the form of a hand where is it brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh right. to jealousy yeah so the that the door of the inner gate that looked toward the north that that was where the sacrifices were offered mm-hmm. so right in place of this place of sacrifice which is a type of the work of Christ for the sins of the world They've put a, an idol right there. Yep. They've they've completely replaced That's that. Right. So you know it's like that coupled with verse sixteen just shows the complete opposition. It wasn't just like oh they were dabbling in some things. They had just completely turned their, turned away from the worship of the true God. Um, but so a question that arises from this. So I I'm I tend to think that the word idolatry is a bit overused. Yeah, I think so. Too. Um, I think we talk about, oh, we've made an idol out of this or that and that kind of thing. Um, and it's like, I don't know if that really fits the definition of idolatry. But then again, in our context, as you know, living in the Western world in, in the United States, you don't have nearly as much like blatant literal idol worship. Yeah. No. But... But what, so what does idolatry, and not just in this passage, but throughout Scripture, what does idolatry mean for us, these warnings? What does that look like for our immediate context? That's a great question. Uh, I, I think, first of all, it, there has to be a sense of what idolatry essentially was. And it was, it was 
ascribing to deities the ability, and these deities are, are represented in figures that are carved by hand uh, or perhaps some natural phenomenon, whatever, but that they had the ability to, to deliver people from chaos. And people, because they wanted this temporal deliverance, hmm. they would worship these gods. And in the case of Israel, and I think in the case of, well, let's don't get down to cases yet. Hmm. Let's just define. So I think in the, in what Israel is doing is, on, on the one hand, they don't want to give up Yahweh because they have the temple. The temple is such a huge reminder of, of their history and of, of their religion, and then there's the sacrifices. But I, I think at the end of the day, they're just hedging their bets all mm -hmm. around. And, and Yahweh becomes nothing more to them than another religion, although, or albeit maybe their, their most showy one, their, their largest one, is still uh, represents their trying to, that's not the word I wanted to use, their, their aspiration to control and manipulate their environment mm -hmm. for positive outcomes, of course. Now, is, when Israel came back, they did not go back to idolatry, to, to the worship of idols, to religious syncretism in the sense that they're trying to, to sync with the gods of, of the Canaanites and then later on the Egyptians and the Babylonians and whoever else came along with the god. They, they certainly learned better than that. You see that in, in Ezra and Nehemiah. You see that in Daniel. You see it in the latter prophets. But what they did was they still, even the remnant that survives and comes back, their hearts are divided. You know, and you see they don't, they come back and they, they neglect the temple. They build their own houses uh, while they're neglecting the temple. They're not worshiping idols. They're just not worshiping God. Um, I, I've thought a lot about this in, in this series. Okay, so what does it mean to us today? I think there are... And I don't mean to be hypercritical, but I think there are Christian, denomination is not a good word because Catholicism is not a denomination. <laughs> okay, Catholicism is its own thing and it's, you know, it's, it's called Christian in Christendom. But let's face it, there are many idols in, in in, mm -hmm. in Catholicism. I mean, things that you can see, things that are revered. If you go back to the time of Martin Luther, uh, you had the, the icons and you had the, the indulgences and all of these things that people put their hopes in mm -hmm. to control not so much temporal chaos, but chaos in the afterlife. They're, they're trying to make payments. Mm -hmm. For themselves and others so that goes back I think to pagan idolatry and I think it is syncretistic in Catholicism and I don't think a lot of it came out of Roman paganism mm -hmm. I mean you, you can look and, and connect it even even uh, the setting up the worship of Mary so that that's one thing well what about for Protestants what about what the New Testament teaches you know and I said this a few weeks ago maybe it was last week, the New Testament doesn't say much about idols, does it? Hmm. I mean, it's, it talks about food that's been used to worship idols. But then Paul says, and I had this read last week, idols are nothing. Was it in... Uh, it was in 1 Corinthians it, 8 where he says it, that. Is it First John? I'm terrible. I'm so bad with, with specific references. Well, he says, like, little ones, keep yourselves from idols. I think that is in First John. Okay. Uh, and I don't, <laughs> I'd have to look at the context to kind of see what he means there. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the biggest thing in the New Testament as far as what we're to beware of, it's false teaching. Mm. And, and, and not to have the fruit of the Spirit. I, I think that for us, idolatry would be something like this. It is that we, we, we substitute things that we think can satisfy things that we 
default back to when, when we know, when the Holy Spirit within us tells us, this is not what can satisfy you, but we default to that position because we just don't trust God in the moment. We don't trust the, the Word of God in the moment. I mean, that, to me, that, that could be the only way to make some kind of association because I'm like you. I don't, I don't see a lot of idolatry in, in and of itself except for, in, I think, in, in Catholicism. And, and, and there's some other faiths that, uh, man, have just, they're just silly about things, but, you yeah. know, I'm not going to even go there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so turning to the next chapter, another uh, big thing I wanted to, to bring up. So we know that even though this is, this is written, uh, it's written about a particular people and a particular point in history and they're under a different covenant, a different law and, and that sort of thing, uh, we also know that this is here for our instruction and yes. things for us to be Absolutely. to glean from it. Absolutely. Um, so reading verse 4, when the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And then those are the ones that are spared yes. from the coming judgment. Um, and this is kind of a rhetorical question, but what what came to mind there is like, are we sorrowful over sin? Um, you know, I don't think, we've talked about this before, even on some of these panels, um, about how I don't think that the Christian life is meant to be one where we are continually uh, in sorrow. Um, or even shackled by guilt. Right. You know, we, it, we are supposed to live, you know, we have, we have the joy of the Lord and mm -hmm. we, have, um, we have freedom from, from these things. Um, but I do think that there is a time and a, and a place and an attitude um, that we should have about, about sin and, and not just our own personal sins. I'm not just talking about just like getting alone and thinking about how terrible a person I am and then crying about it and, and falling on my knees, etc., but also corporate sin. Yeah. Um, you know, we think about um, things like abortion in, in the United States, things, sins that are, and abominations that are happening and that are being endorsed by Churches. large parts of our nation. Yeah, well, I, I'm getting, I was getting to that yeah. because, so, you know, there's individually, you can go like nationally and go globally, but you can also go uh, within the churches as well, uh, you know, because then um, in verse 6, a couple verses later, begin at my sanctuary. He's saying, go and go do that. Begin at my sanctuary. Yeah. And they began at the ancient men which were before the house. So the first ones to be judged, and that, that, that led me to, to different passages. So it did me too. I have thoughts on that. So yeah. one of them being 1 Corinthians 5, which is a little less direct, but 1 Corinthians 5, 12, and 13. Um, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from yourselves that wicked person. And it's talking about like, you know, Christians, you know, the, Make sure you've got your own house in order right. here before, you know, you, you can't uh, tell the outsiders, you know what I mean, who don't have the law. Like, we're going to receive a, uh, a stricter judgment because of the knowledge that we have. Mm -hmm. There was one verse, uh, I want to say it was in Amos, and I didn't write it down for some reason. Um, but God says to the people, like, you're the only people that I have known, so I'm going to judge you. Because they have that knowledge. They when have that he says he, and when he says known there, he means intimate yes. knowledge, not not that you're the only people I know about. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And I also thought of First uh, Peter chapter four. That's the one I thought about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and I don't know necessarily that it's talking about quite the same thing when right. talking about judgment because it says so the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God and if it first begin at us. What shall be the what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Yeah, and you know, but I was just thinking about that, like so. So putting putting those two verses together of verse four about being, um, you know, looking for 
the, the ones who are spared are the ones who are sorrowing over sin, right. the ones who are conscious of this and, and are yes. repentant and are, are not happy with the status quo at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the judgment beginning at the house of God. And I think about sins that are tolerated. Um, I think about, um, for example, I think about, um, you know, in, in the United States, um, before, you know, pre-Civil War and stuff, then there were Christians who tolerated the worldly practice of, of slavery. Right. And some, some of them tried to use Scripture to, to justify that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it certainly wasn't just Christians that were doing this. This was just, this was just how the world was, and it always has been, and it still continues to this day in certain parts of the world. Right. So it's not like this is alien. However... Um, there's uh, there's precious few Christians in the world today that I think that would that would just try to justify that or would try to to use scripture to to say that that's that's okay and that's a tolerable practice. So I think we've hope you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what I mean, but that's just like one example, but I but I think about other things. I think um one issue that I'm very passionate about and and uh and I can get on a, a, a roll, a roller coaster with it is um, is the toleration of of abuse within the church, um, whether that's um, like spousal abuse that's kind of just overlooked um, because church staff don't know necessarily how to handle those ca- cases uh, in in the most helpful ways, but also spiritual abuse where you have like authoritative sort of mini tyrant sort of leadership within the church um, and, and and that sort of thing. I mean, I, I've, I've been a witness to that. I've seen, I've seen both, both of those kinds of things happen. And um, I think w- when you see it, it kind of, it, it makes it really real for you. And, and uh, that, I was, all these thoughts were kind of coming to mind and I was look, uh, looking at all these things and I was thinking about like, are we a people, are we a church that that sees these things and grieves over them, or are we somebody who, or are, are we people who have kind of come to tolerate it? Uh, you know what I mean? And I think we should be very vocal. I think we should be aggressively rooting this stuff out uh, when we see it. Um, that, there's just thoughts, some thoughts that I have. And I, I, I concur with what you're saying. I, I, I think, first of all, when you look at these passages, for example, the First Peter 4 passage, He's talking about a couple of things, but he's he talking about false teachers, mm-hmm. and they're not to be tolerated. And again, I think if when you go back, I would equate idolatry with, with false teaching, but I'd also equate it maybe to going back to what you said. I, I think false teaching can take on tones of, of people who want to have power. Mm. And I, I think that you see that in the New Testament. I think that some of the adversaries of Paul... In, in Corinth, for example, were people who wanted power. They wanted authority, perhaps even at Galatia. And so he had to resist them. And, and these things that you bring up, the, the people who want to be tyrants, whether it be in the church or whether it be in their home or whether it be wherever, that doesn't show the fruit of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. Love, joy, peace, kindness, uh, long-suffering, forbearance. It doesn't show that. And I... I think that we, we do need to remind each other now, if there's an egregious case, if there was spousal abuse or something like that, then it's our responsibility not only to confront that, but to, to, to bring in whatever help needs to be done. And, yeah. and when, if, if, it were some, if it were somebody in the church uh, abusing somebody in the church, that too. I mean, th- these kinds of things cannot be overlooked by any means. Um, and and it ju- I think it just shows, when, when the church is struggling with issues like that, it just shows that we really don't know who we are. Um, and that when, when, you try to, when you try to guilt people and you try to manage people and manipulate people, they don't know how to follow Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're, they've got all these motivations, and, and for some people, you know, if you were if you were 
a tyrannical leader in a church and, you, and you're all about your authority. And then some guy, you know, in his group or in his family, he, he's not mature and he, he wants to have authority. Then the, the, the leadership of the church encourages that by, by not demonstrating and modeling servant leadership. Mm. You know, and mm-hmm. I, I think I think that's one of the ways God has has changed me through the years. In many ways, I mean, I, I certainly have changed in my in my attitudes as far as uh, you know, man and woman. I don't see that as a tyrannical role for man at all. And, mm-hmm. and you and I have talked about this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, I believe that man is a leader in his home, but he's not the dictator in his home. Mm. You know. And I've read some things by people that I agree with on many things, but disagree with on this. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think we need to to strive for maturity in following Christ, and if we do that, it takes care of a lot of other things, mm-hmm. and uh, idolatry being one of them. Yeah. yeah, may may we always have our eyes opened to to those kinds of things that we cannot um, let us not grow um, tolerant. Yeah. You know, that was that was kind of like my prayer as I was reading this earlier today was like, you know, like I hope that we remain a people that it, it that is do a point. sorrow. And I don't that. think that I don't think that people when I look at Ezekiel and in chapter nine and he says, Alas, Lord God are you going to kill everybody? <laughs> you know, he's not, he's not just sorrowful because they're dying. He's sorrowful because of where they are. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think that's, as a church, we, we tend to be condemnatory towards where people are. And that's not our call. You don't, you don't see Paul on Mars Hill He's not condemnatory. He starts out trying to find, you know, a, a common thread, so to speak. Uh, I've noticed that you're worshiping a lot of gods and that you're very religious. Well, let me tell you about the God you're missing. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the kind of leadership that, that we need in our churches and that we need in our homes and in our communities. Yeah. Absolutely. Compassion. Compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Servant leadership. Absolutely. Well, we've about run out of time. Thank you for coming. And uh, for those who don't know, Patrick's here. I'm kind of a short notice tonight. He didn't get an outline, so my apologies <laughs> for that. But uh, I'll strive to do better. We're, we're kind of reshifting the schedule, but now we're back to uh, Sunday nights. And so I think we can get back on a, a good schedule, a good routine. And uh, as always, thanks, John, for what you do. And uh, let's, let's close in prayer. Would you close us in prayer? Sure. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have made. Lord, we thank you for the ability to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for your word, your self-revelation. Lord, we thank you about for, for teaching us these things about, um, about history and about yourself and about your people, Lord, and, and, and placing these things here for our instruction. May you continue to illumine these things as we ponder them throughout the week. Um, that you would write them on our hearts, Lord, and, and cause us to be a people who, who do indeed sorrow over sin, Lord, who are never, never become callous toward it or, mm-hmm. or tolerant of it, and that we um, would be a people who reflect uh, the heart of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.